Well, it's now 1 o'clock. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Thank you all for coming and also thank the City of Watertown for letting us use the council chamber today. For those of you who I haven't met, I'm Jim Sensenbrenner, your congressman. Uh, up here with me is State Representative John Jagler, who represents the Watertown area and is here to listen to your comments and answer your questions on state issues while I try to do the same on federal issues. I want to thank the local law enforcement officials for their service this afternoon as well. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns. In fact, in 2017, I held 115 public meetings. You may have heard that some of those meetings have become very contentious. So I want to be sure to review the rules that we need to adhere to so that we can have an orderly environment in which to exchange ideas. First, I ask you all to sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears on the sign-in slips. That way I'll know to call on you during the first portion of the meeting. I will be giving priority to those of you who reside in Watertown in the immediate area. Then, if time permits, I will continue to call on residents of the 5th Congressional District from other parts of the district. And if additional time is available, I will call on those who don't reside in the 5th District. The first portion of the meeting will last about an hour and 20 minutes. I expect participants to be respectful and to allow the person who is recognized and has the floor the opportunity to speak without interruptions, as well as when I respond to each comment. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment you would like to make has already been made, please refrain from asking it again. We should try to hear from as many of you as we can within the time constraints, and if any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there is nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. My last meeting in Wauwatosa, I had to do that after giving seven warnings, you know, to allow uh, everybody to express their opinions. And there were some people who wished to ask questions on other subjects that ended up not being able to ask them because of the disorderly behavior of certain but not all members of the crowd. Your signs are okay in this room. <coughs> as long as they are not disruptive or obstructive. The second portion of the meeting will be devoted to those of you who seek my help or the help of Representative Jagler with personal problems they're experiencing with either the federal or the state government. This part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have one-on-one -on -one private conversations and is not the time to continue discussions from the general part of the meeting. Any filming or recording is prohibited during this portion of the meeting, and a lot of this is due to the fact that many people have got problems with the VA medical, and they're talking about their medical issues, and we do not wish to have that filmed and up on social media because it would be an invasion of their privacy. So without any further ado, starting with the people from Watertown first, Eric Allerman. North 2nd Street in Watertown. Hi, Congressman, thank you for uh, for your time today. Shame on you for being a Bears fan. I'm not, I'm not a Bears fan, I'm a Packer fan. Well, what's that on? I'm a Cubs fan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'll, I'll not, we, we brewers need a lot more sympathy and a lot more help. Yeah, well, you know, it's fun to go to Miller Park and turn that into Wrigley North. But anyway, um, getting, getting to it. Um, as you know, as uh, has been experienced in the last week and a half or so, the uh, the shootings in Parkland, Florida, and others that you know we can name, we can all we can all list them. It's obviously a problem in our society, sir. So I ask you, not just in schools, but everywhere in society, what um, you and your elected uh, colleagues in the House and the Senate can do to help stem 
uh, stem this problem? Well, you know, this is a timely question, and it's, it's an important question. You know, let me start out by saying that this was an unspeakable tragedy of what happened in Parkland, Florida. And the thoughts and the prayers of this country have got to go out not only to the victims and their families, but all of the kids who were terrified in the school when the shooter came in, you know, and started firing away. Let me make a couple of points. First of all, there has been a law on the books for over 20 years that makes it illegal to carry a firearm within a thousand feet of any school in the country. That law was not enforced. Congress does not enforce laws. The executive branch enforces laws. And we've seen an awful lot of things fall through the cracks uh, that resulted in this, uh, uh, in this tragedy. You know, the FBI ignored a tip that came in that the shooter uh, had a mental problem and was talking about shooting up schools. The security officer didn't go in the, into the school when the firing took place and was fired. There were three sheriff's deputies, you know, who were outside the school and didn't go into the school uh, to save lives uh, uh, on that. And there's got to be a lot of introspection on that as well. Now, I think there is a way that we can balance uh, constitutional rights that all of us are given through the Second Amendment with increasing safety, not only in schools, but elsewhere. And that's something that we're going to have to do because if we don't do that, somebody is going to file a lawsuit in the federal court and get, you know, whatever practice or whatever law is deemed to have violated a, a constitutional right thrown out as unconstitutional. So let me say, right from the beginning, in 1993 and 1994, I was the principal Republican author of the Brady Bill. The Brady Bill at first provided a five-day waiting period from the time someone ordered a gun until the time someone could pick it up. But I was insistent that there be a national instant check system and was able to get the NICS system uh, that into the Brady Bill. And once the NICS system was fully up and operational, and that took about five years because a lot of uh, criminal and mental health records uh, were on three by five cards and they had to be put in a manner that could be put into a, a, a computer. But once it was operational, uh, the waiting period dropped away and a result of what the provision of the Brady Bill that I was insisted on did, there were over 700,000 uh, gun sales to people who uh, were not legally entitled to have a gun because a felony conviction or a mental incompetency adjudication uh, ended up being stopped. 700,000 of them. And the Brady campaign, which is probably uh, the one that balances off the NRA on the other side, got out a release that said that is the single most important gun control issue that has been passed by Congress in history. You know, and I stand by that, and it was 700,000 plus gun sales that were stopped. Now, certain federal agencies, including the military, you know, have not been putting data into the NICS system. Uh, the House has passed, the Senate has not passed the Fix NICS bill, which I was a co-sponsor of, and I support it. The Senate ought to get through that, through that right away. Well, you know, what I can say is, is that, you know, there, there are a lot of things, you know, that we can legislate until we're blue in the face, but really are not effective in stopping mass murders like we've seen in Parkland and beforehand. And, you know, the question that I ask people as a result of Parkland in Las Vegas is what type of law that could be passed that would have stopped this before it started. And a lot of what I hear, you know, again, has nothing to do with stopping it. You know, there were laws that prevented people from carrying guns within school zones. But Congress makes laws that doesn't enforce the law. I support, you know, getting rid of bump stocks. And, you know, I've sent a letter to the Justice Department and I hope they get you move on that because that makes a semi-automatic weapon fire like a fully automatic weapon. And fully automatic weapons or machine guns have been illegal to get in this country without a very hard to get permit for 80 years now. 
and semi-automatic weapons are legal for hunting in most states, <laughs> including ours. So, you know, we've, we've got to, you know, start thinking of how we deal with people who misuse guns and keeping guns out of the hands of them. I think one of the keys to doing this is to have a better screening on mental health issues because practically everybody who has been involved in a mass shooting has demonstrated some type of a mental health issue before the shooting takes place. And when you're dealing with something like this or with a terrorist act, we have to be proactive in identifying these people and making sure that they don't do that. And there might have to be some changes in state and federal mental health laws, and if we need to do that, so be it. But, you know, you can't consider uh, these types of, 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 of acts as crimes because with the crime we wait for the crime to be committed and people get killed rather than stopping them proactively. What we need to do is figure out how to better stop them proactively, uh, which is going to mean a lot of the things that I talked about, but also vigorously enforcing the laws that are already on the books. And if the laws that were already on the books were enforced, and the FBI and local law enforcement had done their job down in Florida, all those kids would have been alive today and we would not be talking about a national tragedy. Um, Diane, is it Leffler? Dwayne. Dwayne, okay. I've got one question I can never figure out is, why the people in government can't get along and get something accomplished to Democrats and Republicans? If private industry worked that way, we'd be a third world country. Well, what I'll, t I'll tell you, sir, is we do get along on an awful lot of things, but you never hear about it. Uh, because the media increases their ratings, they sell more newspapers by talking about conflict and controversy and real or perceived misconduct. Uh, and, you know, it's very frustrating for those of us that work out there because we do do an awful lot of work across the aisle uh, on that. And, you know, I've introduced and gotten passed a whole lot of bills that were bipartisan in nature. You know, whenever I get something passed like this, you know, I, you know, send out a press release and uh, it goes to all the local uh, media outlets, including the TV stations and the radio stations, and darned if it never gets on the air. Uh, again, because conflict and controversy and misconduct uh, raise ratings and allow them to charge more for advertising. Now, I grant you the fact that, you know, they're in business. There are some things where, you know, there are Democrats and Republicans, you know, have an opposite view on what the role of government ought to be. But that has been the system in our country ever since George Washington. Uh, we've had a very skewed reporting of what Congress does. You know, and it, it makes me, you know, really kind of angry. You know, I can call up Democratic colleagues and they can call me up and, you know, we, we talk about it and in a lot of things uh, we're able to, you know, reach some kind of an agreement. You know, for example, on the opioid bill last year, which I was the principal House author of, you know, I worked very closely with Democratic Whip Steny Hoyer of Maryland to get that passed and signed by President Obama. I did the same thing with the amendments to the Americans with Disability Act, uh, which I was uh, very key on. Uh, also passed and signed into law, uh, not newsworthy uh, on that. I think that these laws, you know, have made you know, a great difference, you know, in the quality of life uh, in the future, particularly for those who are either disabled uh, who or who are addicted to opioids. So, you know, I'm frustrated that you don't get the information that you need, you know, to be able to make up your mind, you know, on who's working on a bipartisan basis and who isn't. The people who are partisan shills on both sides get on TV, particularly cable TV. If you want to hear one side, you tune into Fox News. If you want to hear the other side, you turn into MSNBC. But even the mainstream shows, you know, of the four major networks, you know, they you know, really don't go into uh, people actually working on legislation and getting things passed. Can I ask you one more thing? Sure. When are we going to pay, pay out $23 trillion debt? Well, 
You know, the answer, you know, I've always favored a balanced budget except in times of war or national emergency. Uh, because the only way to stop Congress from spending, you know, is to have a constitutional restriction on how much Congress can spend. Uh, you know, the debt, you know, is the debt is going to come back to bite us uh, sometime sooner rather than later, in, you know, in my opinion. You know, on the other hand, you know, we saw the Kennedy tax cut, the Reagan tax cut, uh, the, the Bush uh, Jr. tax cut end up collecting more money because people were uh, making more money and paying more taxes. The reason the debt went up is Congress spent all of that extra money. Congress has got to stop doing that, and that means that we've got to say no to people who want to have expensive goodies because any budget, including the national budget, you know, ought to be a priority, and the things that are of lower priority we should not be funding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I may, just yeah. on the state level. Yeah. Ninety-three percent of the bills signed into law by Governor Walker this session in Wisconsin had bipartisan votes. And it is very frustrating to us who work on the other side of the aisle. I had a bill pertaining to mental health issues when, when a doctor or an emergency physician has a problem with a person in crisis and they believe this person may harm themselves or may go out and shoot somebody or, sh or do a mass shooting. There was a reluctance for doctors to contact law enforcement because of privacy concerns. I worked very hard with Representative Eric Gingrich of uh, Green Bay we got this bill passed uh, that doctors are, are applauding and nobody knows about it because it's not a sexy story because there isn't fighting and they're screaming and it was a voice vote on the assembly floor. So it is very frustrating when we do reach across the other side of the aisle and, and nobody knows about it. Maybe it's a, I need to do a better job of communicating that, but it's, it's frustrating to hear there's no bipartisanship going on in Madison and when there's a lot. Well, you know, what I can say is when there's a voice vote either in Madison or in Washington, D.C., it's because nobody wants to vote no, because they would demand a roll call vote so they could be recorded as voting no. Uh, Crystal Steckrod. Steckrod, right here. Okay, go ahead. Hi. I have a couple of questions, mainly about the schools. Mm -hmm. And I, this probably a better question for, as a state representative, because we live in a world where gun-free zones, right? You think they're working? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, and I have a second question. Are students taught what to do in a crisis? Yes. 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 They are? Yes. 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 Okay. We have drills. Like you have you have they have drills. fire drills. We have yeah. Yeah. Okay. Drills. And was that security guard in Parkside or Parkland, was he armed? The yes. one guy yes. outside? Yes. So they do have armed security guards. And how do you feel about having armed security <coughs> guards at the schools? Well, we, uh, we in the assembly just passed a bill that would authorize state funding to match any school district that would, would want it. That would want that it. Would want so it would be on a voluntary basis? Yes. Uh, and the other measure that I'm working on, uh, in fact, uh, look for the, doing more with uh, the Watertown School District. I talked to Cassandra Shug. Just, uh, the other night at these chamber dinner is to look at areas where schools like Watertown High School built post Columbine um, can be a security risk because the main entryway when you walk in if you walked into the high school you get buzzed in from someone 30 feet away once they're in they're in a main common area which is a, a potential threat and I, I have a meeting this week with the, uh, the uh, liaison police officer there talk about possible state grants to build their, to make it more secure on the on the entrance point. And do you think they're going to keep the schools gun free? Gun free zones? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm I've always been for local control of schools yeah. because uh, having a locally elected school board run the schools means that the schools will be more responsive to local needs and local issues. On that, so you know, these types of questions I think are best answered uh, at the local level. And we do have a school board election coming up, and you know, it's unfortunate that there are not many voters that decide to show up and vote at them. Everybody ought to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Lois Kirkpatrick, Duffy Street, Watertown. Um, I would like to know 
uh, if you are in favor of privatizing uh, Medicare or Social Security benefits? The answer to that is no. Uh, Can you repeat the question, please? The question is, am I in favor of privatizing <laughs> Medicare and Social Security benefits? The answer to the question is no. However, you know, earlier today, before we got the room opened up, uh, I did meet with people who were enrolled in the Medicare Advantage program, which is run by private insurance companies, but that is voluntary. And the people who sign up for Medicare Advantage think it's a better deal than being in traditional Medicare. I am for giving the people that kind of choice. And what happens is the amount of money that Medicare spends on the average Medicare beneficiary is simply transferred to pay all or part of the premium uh, for Medicare Advantage. So again, this is something that is a beneficiary's choice. Uh, if the choice ends up being wrong, they can always go back into traditional Medicare. And, you know, I'm not saying that either program is best for everybody, uh, but everybody ought to have the chance to decide which one is better for them. Uh, Dave Letterer, Fremont Street, Watertown. Hi. Um, I was doing some figuring today with my calculator, and if my figures are right, it takes to spend one billion dollars at the rate of ten thousand dollars a day it takes two hundred seventy three point seven eight five years to spend one billion dollars now the new budget that was just proposed projects a one trillion dollar deficit in just in this next budget cycle mm -hmm. that would be multiplying this number this two hundred and seventy three years times 1,000. <coughs> How can we do that? That's we that's not sustainable. We can't, and I voted against that budget. <coughs> yes. Good. Uh, Jan, is it D tree? D yes, it is, sir. Okay, go ahead. Well, first of all, I thank you for um, having the courage to come out and see us, because some people don't, <laughs> some <laughs> legislators do <coughs> Um, first of all, I'm a retired educator, mm -hmm. and um, I have a 14-year-old grandson in a school, and a high school, and I share her concern. Um, I do think, um, there's, I was in Florida last week, and I saw blow by blow, um, we watched on the news the horrifying events that were there. And um, I did have some thoughts about, uh, and some questions for you. First of all, um, my thoughts and prayers are with you, because you have some tough decisions to make about gun control. And uh, and I'm not and, and uh, so I um, I know that uh, that the NRA is a powerful force in our country. Millions of dollars are spent um, to get people elected, and I know that um, you sir have received some money from the NRA as well. And I know they have given you an A rating as far as gun control. Um, with your votes on gun control. So uh, so I am concerned about about that that that. Concern. One thing that could have been perhaps done um, to prevent that shooting is if that young man did not have that weapon in his hand. If he had not been able to get yeah. the yeah. if that young man had not been able to go out and purchase that um, AR-15, um, he would not have been able to uh, shoot that many kids in those five or six or however many minutes it took him to do it. And so, and so there are some things that could have been done to prevent that. The age thing is one thing. I mean, he, you could raise the age of, of, of being able to buy those kinds of weapons. You could be able, you could um, uh, ban the uh, magazines, uh, whatever they call that, the uh, magazines, however they call that, the high, high, capacity. high capacity magazines, thank you. <laughs> and so then, and you could ban those kinds of guns from being private ownership. Yes. Military people are trained. <laughs> are trained to, to shoot those type of weapons. So why can a 19-year-old kid go in and get that weapon? So those are some things that Congress could do, and that's why, sir, I really hope that you open your heart to what you're hearing today from many people and, and really take a serious look at, at passing some gun control laws that have some bite. And, so, and then my other question for you is, are you going to continue to take donations from the NRA? 
Well, the NRA is free to contribute or not to contribute to me. You know, I call issues as I see them, and I will repeat the fact that the Brady campaign said that I was the principal Republican author of the most effective gun control legislation that has ever been passed by Congress. Now, if the NRA didn't like it, you know, you know that was too bad. It stopped over 700,000 uh, gun sales to people who were uh, ineligible to purchase a firearm because of either a felony conviction or a mental incompetency adjudication. Now, you know, with respect to semi-automatic rifles, they are legal for hunting in practically every state in the country, including Wisconsin. A uh, semi-automatic rifle can be used. Now, I'm not for saying that something that our state fish and game officials, you know, say can be used for hunting by licensed hunters should be banned across the board. What I am saying is that what we have to do is we have to be much more sensitive to people who exhibit mental health problems before they end up causing a tragedy. And, you know, that's where the problem was. This kid exhibited them on a number of occasions. It was on social media. He was saying this to his friends such to the fact that one of them called up the FBI and said, watch out for uh, Mr. Cruz on that. The FBI did nothing. If the FBI had done something, they would have sent somebody to talk to him, you know, and figure out what was going on, and, you know, then they could have put a block in the NIC system for him, you know, acquiring, you know, a firearm. Now, we did have a semi-automatic ban uh, during a time in the Clinton administration. After the ban expired, there was no increase in the number of crimes that were committed with semi-automatic weapons. It was something that was cosmetic. It did not get to the root cause of the problem. And, you know, I'm here to say I am open uh, to changing the law, but I want to know what proposal would have stopped tragedies like this from happening. I can answer very clearly. Uh, banning bump stocks would have at least uh, mitigated what happened in Las Vegas when the shooter was shooting out of the hotel uh, 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 window on that. I wrote the Justice Department to ban bump stocks. You know, they're in the process of uh, opening up a, a regulation to ban bump, bump stocks on that. Uh, there are a lot of people who think that bump stocks are fine. I don't, because bump stocks turn a legal semi-automatic weapon into operating like an illegal automatic weapon. And machine guns are not semi-automatic weapons. They are automatic weapons where one pull of the trigger, you know, ends up uh, firing, you know, a whole lot of, of bullets. A semi-automatic weapon, you have to pull the trigger each time you wish to have the gun shoot. The other thing is, is you know, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution at the beginning of every term. That includes the Second Amendment. Uh, on that. And the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court held in the Heller decision that the Second Amendment was an individual right. So that's what the constitutional law is in the United States of America today. That each of us has an individual right to keep or bear arms if we wish to keep or bear arms. Nobody's forcing us. Well-regulated militia. More? Yes. Don't leave that out of that Second Amendment. Excuse me, the Supreme Court rejected that in the Heller decision. So the law today is as I have stated. It, you know, the well-regulated militia, you know, was in the Second Amendment. That was the issue that was presented to the Supreme Court I believe by the officials in the District of Columbia, and uh, the Supreme Court rejected it and said that there is an individual right. That's how the Supreme Court has interpreted the Constitution, and I cast my votes consistent with the oath I took to uphold the Constitution, even though it might not be the most politically correct thing to do uh, at any time. Why can't you pass a law? No, Let me hey, just. Why can't you pass a law uh, limiting sir, the sir, size sir, of the clip? Sir, Ms. Streckrod has got the, the floor. 
You've no, already had. I'm done. Okay, Dietrich, I'm sorry. Dietrich, well, I, I would reiterate his question. Perhaps you could pass a law that would limit limit the size of the clip, gun, the clip, or or eliminate the gun. If they didn't have that weapon, those kids would still be walking around Ma'am, let me answer. Okay. I will tell you that that law will be declared unconstitutional by the federal courts. Now, I'm not going to run around trying to make people feel good by voting for laws that I think are unconstitutional. You know, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. The Supreme Court has interpreted the Constitution as I have stated. Now, the Supreme Court can either change its mind and sometimes they do that, and sometimes they don't. Or uh, an amendment uh, could be proposed to the Second Amendment, which will not pass. I can guarantee you that. Uh, so, you know, I, I want to be honest what can be done. Because every time we have one of these tragedies, you know, there are people that say that Congress should legislate something new. And what I am saying is, is that None of these proposals, in my opinion, would have stopped what happened in Florida. The banning of bump stocks, which I support, would have uh, mitigated somewhat what happened in Las Vegas uh, because the shooter could not have fired as many rounds into the crowd at the, at the Country and Western uh, Conference. So let's talk about things that are effective. Let's talk about things that are constitutional. And the Constitution... Excuse me. That second warning. Uh, you know, the Constitution was passed to protect the citizens from government encroachment. And that's something that we should never forget because it has made America different than any other country in the world. I have one more thing to say. Your great your Brady bill your, your your bill did prevent some of these things from happening until it lapsed in two thousand four. So, so well, I the think Brady were, I bill, think the you, Brady bill did not lapse. The Brady bill is the law today. Well, the the, the ban on the uh, assault rifles, well, semi-automatic, that lapsed in 2004. It lapsed in it lapsed in. And so you were effective then. Okay, well, it lapsed in 2004, and the statistics are is that there was no increase in crimes committed by semi-automatic weapons after the ban uh, lapsed than the 10 years that we had the ban. So it was an ineffective uh, piece of legislation. But it wouldn't be now. Yeah, would it be now? I have said right in the beginning that I don't want to see or hear any interruptions, either when I am responding to a question or somebody uh, is asking a question. Now, this is the third time I have mentioned this. The last meeting I had in Wauwatosa, I warned the audience seven times before I had to adjourn the meeting. I hope not to be able to do that, but that's going to require a little bit of respect for uh, the opinions of people that you might not agree with, whether it's Representative Jagler or me or somebody in the, in the audience. And the only way this country has been able to survive is by people respecting diverse opinions. Please do that. Now. Sue Will of Hill Road. Yeah. Hello, Congressman. Um, I think I've written you probably, uh, first of all, I am a teacher, and I do not want to be armed. That I know. Um, <laughs> I believe that this should be a decision made by a local school board, and I think it should be a decision that would be up to each teacher if the local school board decides that it's okay to arm teachers. You know, I've never served on a local school board. I think school boards are you know, one of the toughest jobs uh, that people run for. And if I served on a local school board, I would not vote to arm teachers in the schools under the jurisdiction of that board. I hope not. <laughs> at, at, um, I've written you probably once a month, since the month of October, I believe. Um, I have a real concern and I feel like it's falling on uh, deaf ears uh, um, by the congressman about the Russian whatever it is. I don't want to say there's, <laughs> but there's a lot of 
evidence pointing to friends of the executive or our president um, maybe not doing things correctly, and I'm concerned for this um, economic safety, the military safety, the safety of our democracy by some of these, from what I understand, criminal acts and how close they are to our president. And are you going to, or I, I don't want to say are you going to, <coughs> is the Republican Party, are the people who represent me going to represent me and country? I'm concerned with voting just the party line. Well, first of all, let me say I supported the Russian sanctions bill, which was passed by both houses and signed by President Trump. Uh, under the Constitution, the President runs foreign policy. He's not required to impose the sanctions, but he has the congressional authority to do so if he so chooses to do that. Secondly, I support Robert Mueller and his investigation. People have come to these meetings uh, saying, you know, uh, you think Mueller should be fired. The answer to that question is no, I do not. I believe that he should be fired. You know, when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee and Mueller was the FBI director, I worked with him on a lot of sensitive issues, and some of that, you know, incurred bungled procurement by his predecessor as FBI director. Mr. Mueller has always treated me with respect. I have, uh, uh, he has taken into account some of the concerns that I had as being the chief house overseer, you know, the FBI. And I believe that he should be allowed to continue his investigation and let the chips fall where they may. Now, you know, that being said, none of the indictments that have been brought so far uh, have had anything to do with alleged Russian interference in the election, including the ones that came last week. You know, I don't know how many Americans would respond to any type of foreign interference, whether it came from Russia or anybody else. And I have yet to find one person who has come to these meetings that changed their vote from Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump uh, in the fall of uh, 2016 because it would make Mr. Putin happy. Uh, so, uh, you know, the fact, the fact of the matter remains is that we'll see if there's any criminal activity. Uh, Mueller should uh, 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 get to the bottom of this uh, when he completes his investigation. Uh, he can either have a grand jury indict people that he thinks probably committed crimes, but he will report to the American public what his findings are. And then we can talk about what to do about it. So, um, so I just want to follow up on what you said. So even though you, as a Congress, impose sanctions for election interference, the President doesn't have to Well, we impose them? sanctions for a whole lot of things, you know. The invasion and the occupation of Crimea, the invasion of the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, there have been arms sales uh, that really shouldn't have been, the fact that, uh, you know, he has ended up taking over uh, Syria and supporting the brutal Assad government in Syria. So it's not just what happened in the 2016 election. But we uh, Mr. Putin is a bad actor and he should be sanctioned for all of his bad actions and the European community you know, has been working with us to do that. But we haven't been enforcing them because that falls within the legislative branch? I mean, the you know, executive branch? Yeah, the, the, you know, you know the, the president has the exclusive constitutional authority to conduct foreign policy. And there have been fights between Congress and the president over who can do what since the days of George Washington. Mm -hmm. This isn't new. Seems serious. Though. Yeah. Rick Tortomasi, yes, is a Creekside Court in Watertown. Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate you coming out and talking to the people of your district. Uh, you've been a congressman a long time. I've lived in this district 35 years. I can't remember another congressman. Mm -hmm. How long have you been in office? Uh, this is my 20th term. 20th. So that's 40 years. 40 years. That's 40 years. The people talk about term limits. <laughs> I think term limits are called elections. If you don't like what your congressman is doing, that's my you know, point. That's, uh, uh, that's the time to express that. I think it's just as wrong uh, to say who you can't vote for than saying who you have to vote for. 
That's exactly my point. Obviously, the people <coughs> in the 5th District want you to keep representing them. At least the majority do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but thank you for your efforts. I know how hard it is to get any kind of law passed through. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I'm here. I hope to God we do come up with something about guns. I'm a believer in if you take away the guns, only the outlaws will have guns. Mm -hmm. And that's seen yeah. all the time. There's a shooting every day in Milwaukee, uh, every day in Chicago, multiple shootings. Guns are not the problem. People are the problem. How do we how do we attack the people? It starts in growing up. The homeless kids, the kids that don't have direction. You got to start at the basis. I don't know what Congress could do about it, but obviously, the country is upset with government. We don't trust government. That's why we have the president we have today. Throw the bums out, drain the swamp. You know. Is that the answer? Yes. Probably not. Correcting, correcting the problem is difficult. And I give you credit for staying in there 40 years and trying to correct it. Thank you. Bryce Sabluski, Woodridge Trail Water Town. Yes. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Some of my questions have been answered, so I'm going to skip to, to the main one. And I just mentioned here by this gentleman, uh, you've been in service for 40 years. You've watched this country grow, develop, whatever, over those 40 years. So my question to you is, given the division that exists in this country right now, which I think to many people when they look at it seems irreconcilable, how important or how soon do you think it might be before we have to have a constitutional convention to decide what kind of country we're going to be, whether we're going to be a constitutional republic or whether we're going to be some other kind of totalitarian state or whatever? Well, under Article 5 of the Constitution, only the states can call a constitutional convention. And it was a way the framers put in the Constitution to get around Congress on this. Now, we've only had one constitutional convention in our history, and the convention was called to revise the Articles of Confederation, and the people who met in Philadelphia threw that charge in the wastebasket and wrote an entirely new constitution, which I think has served this country well because it was the first constitution <coughs> in the world that limited the power of government to infringe upon individual citizens. Nobody had a constitution before that, and a lot of subsequent constitutions have ended up copying the United States Constitution. Constitutional experts disagree on whether a convention once seated can simply rewrite the entire constitution or whether they are limited for the purpose for which the convention was called. I don't have an answer to that question, but that you know is a major question. The second thing is, is I think we can guarantee that if we have a convention, the delegates to that convention will not be enlightened individuals like Washington and Madison and Franklin and the whole uh, gamut of the founders. Jefferson was in Paris, by the way, as the, the ambassador there, so he was not at, at the convention. Or whether we would have a convention that would be made up of representatives of special interest groups. Uh, on that and if we end up having that kind of a convention you will have a constitution that protects special interest groups but not protecting the people at large so this is something that i think is going to have to be thought through uh, you know very very closely now saying that this is something that congress has no say over uh let me defer to representative jagler <laughs> the there was a lot of discussion uh, about an Article 5 uh, concerning the balanced budget for the purpose solely of, of balancing the budget. Uh, it was a devote in the assembly. There was many concerns about whether it would turn into, as, as the congressman said, a runaway convention. And I don't have the answer to that, but that was a, a, a concern of many. Um, that while, while the intent may be to limit, uh, uh, to, to 
eliminate spending, it could turn into anything and everything. And there was a lot of discussion on that, and I'm not a constitutional expert. Just a follow-up, if I may. Go ahead. If you look at the situation today, you find states, individual states, disobeying the supreme law of the land, if I'm quoting the Constitution correctly. If it's passed by the Congress and signed by the President and okayed by the Supreme Court, it's the supreme law of the land. Mm -hmm. But there are states who are saying, no, it isn't. We're going to do it differently in our state. We fought a civil war over that issue, and we right. shouldn't yeah. forget about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have, I know, but you have Texas versus, versus white, and I'm, I'm guessing there are a lot of people in Texas who, who would think it's time for them to secede from the Union again. Mm -hmm. Because they don't like the way things are, the way things are going. And that's, that's the issue. I, it's, it's just very, very difficult for anybody, I think, to actually see that we're ever going to reconcile the differences that exist in this country. They're ideologically so far apart well, that, that it isn't going to happen. Well, We're going to have to redefine yeah. who and what we are. You know, you know, let me say the worst offender in that is California. Yeah. Yeah. California's got the most mixed up finances, you know, of any state in the union, you know, with their borrowing, their pension funds and things like that. And, you know, a lot of the current issue is over sanctuary cities. Um, sanctuary cities go against federalism. The Constitution clearly gives Congress, you know, the right to pass immigration laws. And most of the immigration laws were passed and signed uh, when we had a Democratic president. The major immigration law uh, was a Kennedy-Rodino bill signed into law by Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965. Uh, and, you know, my, you know, you know, I, you know, I strongly object to the fact that if a state doesn't like the federal law, you know, that's too bad. And about a quarter of the people in the California state prison system are illegal immigrants who are convicted of a crime and sentenced to prison uh, in the state of California. And who pays for that? The federal taxpayers do, you know, under a prison program uh, that says that because the federal government didn't do his job and these people are in the country illegally, then it's a federal responsibility to pay for people who are in prison for being convicted of violating a state criminal law. That's ridiculous. And to get back, you know, we have to pass an immigration law, and the immigration laws are a mess today. I think everybody agrees with that. We have to pass an immigration law, but we have to enforce it and we shouldn't be giving federal money to states that choose not to. May, may I have just one more? Sure. On a different issue. The budget and the deficit has been brought up, the debt. What do you think is going to happen if the Chinese succeed in making the yuan the reserve country, or the reserve currency of the world? We're, we're going to have, you know, runaway inflation here. Uh, we're going to end up, uh, you know, having to pay for our imported oil in yuan rather than in dollars. And you'll see that at the pump and, you know, with, uh, you know, any type of petroleum <coughs> product uh, bill. And it will end up that the Chinese will be controlling, you know, the world's economy in a globalized economy. You know, these communists that run China are pretty smart capitalists. <laughs> Denise O'Halloran, Green Valley, Watertown. Um, well, my question was going to be on the EPA because I am really concerned about the environment. But just sensing from the crowd, I'm going to switch over to the NRA. Um, you mentioned that um, you think the NRA has a right to give you, to put place their money wherever, but you don't have to take money from them. Correct. Nobody, nobody, has, nobody has to take money okay. from. Nobody has to take money from anybody. But, you know, what I can say is they can make their contributions, plus or minus, based upon my record and where I stand. I tell them the same thing I have told you today on that. And again, the, you know, I come back to the point that the law, the Brady Bill, in the press release last week, 
which I was the principal Republican co-sponsor of when it passed in 1993, uh, was included the NICS program. And the Brady Group says it was the most effective gun control law that has ever been passed. Now, I guess with a lot of people here, I'm not going to get any credit for that. And the NRA wasn't very happy with me on that. But it has saved lives and it was effective. It isn't something that will be ineffective. The crux of the matter is identifying people who have uh, a mental illness that would cause them to uh, shoot up a school, you know, or shoot up a crowd of people uh, on that. Because, you know, there are enough guns around uh, that uh, people would be able to get them illegally if they were banned and use them for criminal purposes. Another thing is that it's a separate federal crime uh, to commit a crime with a firearm while, you know, while armed, if you have a felony conviction. That law isn't enforced by U.S. attorneys. You know, the one U.S. attorney that did that uh, during the Clinton administration in Richmond, Virginia, uh, before he was let go, uh, ended up reducing the uh, gun crime rate by 70%. Because if you were convicted of a crime while armed with a firearm following a felony conviction, you'd serve your time in the Virginia State Prison, and when you got out, the U.S. Marshal would pick you up and put you in the federal penitentiary. You know, and that says that, you know, if you're, if you're armed and you do the crime and you're not legally eligible to have a firearm, you're going to have two sentences because there are two separate crimes involved. Okay. I'll do respect. You've heard the Brady point. We all were listening. You don't have to repeat it, okay? I know a lot of people have stuff to say, so I just want to just try to be brief. So um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I know you're going to want to elaborate, but I know that a lot of people want to ask questions, so we can follow up on your website. We'll read your thing. But I want to just No, I can elaborate as I see necessary here. Uh, because I don't think everybody should be forced to go into my website. Go ahead. Okay, well, we're happy to do that. Um, if there is a law, and I know it doesn't work like this, I'm being very simplistic, but if you are faced with a law that asks you, will you raise the age limit from 18 to 21 for assault weapons, for buying dangerous guns, would you vote yes for that? It depends upon what was tied with that. No, I'm just saying, that's why I'm saying I'm no, being very no, simplistic. No, no, because, you know, the thing is, is if money is taken away from a state or a school district as blackmail for that, like they did with the drinking age a few years ago, that's wrong, and that's using federal legislation, you know, as, as blackmail, taking money away from states uh, that do not wish to comply with what the federal government is asking them to do. Okay, uh, here's another really simplistic question. If you were faced with a law that says we want to take those assault weapons that are made and designed for war that had, that, that person used in the shooting in the school, would you agree with that? Fully automatic weapons have been illegal except with a very hard to get permit since the 1930s in this country. I would not vote to repeal that. And that's semi -auto Semi-automatic weapons are different and I would not vote for a blanket ban on semi-automatic weapons because they're used by a lot of law-abiding hunters and you know I believe that we should not take away guns that mm -hmm. state fish and game uh, officials have you, you know decided are sporting to use uh, for hunting. I'm not a hunter, I've never had a hunting license. But, you know, I respect those that, you know, enjoy hunting and do it for sport. And, you know, I can say that these people know how to use guns legally, and we should draw the line between those who use guns legally and those who use guns who commit crimes. Okay. One last thing. Um, if you represent our state, right, once you're elected, do you feel you represent everyone Republican, Democrat, everybody in the state? <coughs> well, I try to represent everybody in the state, but in controversial issues, there's only one way I can vote, yes or no. And not everybody is going to agree with my votes, including my <laughs> wife, I might add. <laughs> you know, I come home and say, why'd you vote that way? Uh, 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 but if the majority of Wisconsinites 
or the yeah the majority of Wisconsinites want those assault rifles taken off the market. Would you agree? Well, I if think the you're you know, representing us. Well, there was a statewide referendum that amended the state constitution a few years ago. They have a state constitutional right to keep or bear arms. And that's probably about the only indication where every voter in the state was allowed to, uh, you know, express an opinion on a gun-related issue. So, you know, the answer is, is I think the people of Wisconsin have already spoken on that issue when they voted to ratify that amendment. Uh, Rita Talkowski, Watertown, Second, Second Street, Second Street Road, okay. Yeah. Um, and please speak up so the people in the back room can hear you. Um, I just wrote you an email with my personal experience with the um, Hessen domestic violence. It's HR 909 that was never, well, it was voted on and we voted no. It should be passed. No. Oh. You know, I'm not aware of what all of the provisions of the bill are. We've got I know. I we've know, got we've got about four thousand bills that have been introduced. I know. Um, and then the HR thirty five ninety nine, that is a absolute disgrace by Stephen King, as I mentioned, it's like uh, rewriting Pet Cemetery again. That is um, just forcing the states to um, pass disease to animals back and forth and spreading disease and everything else pass it from state to state. And your bill, which was um, Thank him for his service. The legislation that opened up the government after Senator Schumer's shutdown uh, did provide pay for the period of time that the government was shut down for those employees that were furloughed. Do you actually? What was the question? No, it's, it's, it was right in the text of the legislation. Yeah, but they didn't, they didn't get it right away. And as far as what happened in Well, Florida, the shutdown was Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And it was in the middle of a pay period. Yeah. You know, and people people are paid on a periodic basis, either every two weeks or once a month. And the pay period did not occur during the period of the shutdown. They got paid their full salary, including the shutdown period, when their pay period came up. 
Uh, Alex Byrne, um, Parkview I'm Lane in Watertown. Not finished. Oh. Okay, Miss Talkowski, what else? Um, in regards to Florida, where the armed people were outside and the armed guard was inside, they didn't do their jobs, fell through the cracks. How are we going to prevent that? Well, you know, what I can say is that uh, the the school <coughs> security officer and the three police that were outside were all sheriff's deputies. I know that the sheriff fired the school security officer, but I believe that sheriffs are elected in Florida like they are here, and that sheriff is going to have a lot of explaining to do, you know, when he goes back and asks the voters to give them another term there. Uh, so, you know, there's a direct relationship between an incumbent's performance in office and whether or not he should be reelected. And I hope the voters of Florida remember that. But if they would have done their jobs, do you think it would have happened? No. And if the FBI had done its job, right. you know, and passed that tip on that, uh, you know, an acquaintance of Mr. Cruz you know, passed on to the FBI because he was talking about shooting up the school. Uh, the FBI would have gone out and interviewed him, and it might not have happened if they'd done their job, too. You know, and here you have a case of law enforcement uh, having two of the biggest cracks that uh, uh, the whole issue fell through. And, you know, law enforcement, you know, does a generally good job, you know, and we have to, you know, I back our, our law enforcement and our first responders. But uh, you know, here was something uh, that ended up being very wrong, was not followed up on, and resulted in an unspeakable tragedy. How do you make them do their jobs? Well, oh, well, how do you make anybody do their job? Thank you. You know, maybe, maybe, you gotta... maybe you should go on The Apprentice, and if you don't do your job, somebody will say, you're fired. <laughs> Alex Byrne. Do you believe that groups like uh, the NRA and uh, the Koch brothers have too much of an influence in DC? No, they don't. They don't have any more disproportionate, you know, influence than you know groups like MoveOn.org, you know, organized labor that generous in their campaign contributions and the like. Uh, what the Supreme Court has said on campaign financing, you know, is that candidates who voluntarily put their name on the ballot you know, can have uh, amounts that are contributed to them limited, uh, but individuals and corporations and labor unions cannot. And that's a First Amendment right of free speech and free political expression. Now, you know, what I can say is that I think a lot of the problem that we have stems from our campaign finance laws, which were all very well intentioned, but have, which really have worked out in a very bad way. And the principal one of that is the McCain-Feingold law. Now, before McCain-Feingold, corporations and labor unions could make or give money to political parties, not for candidate advocacy, meaning vote for him or vote against her, but for party-building activities like voter registration drives, rides in the polls, the absentee ballots get out the vote activity or not. McCain Feingold made that illegal, so parties cannot get that anymore. Now, this money just did not dry up. It went to these advocacy groups, you know, that put on negative ads on TV. And if you look back to the 2016 presidential election, most of the ads uh, that were on TV were advocacy groups. They never have anything positive to say about anybody. It was either vote against Hillary or vote against Donald. And as a result, you know, you get this anger and this hatred that has welled up as a part of the political process. Now, to make matters worse, the advocacy groups have now become the ideological police. So if a Republican candidate is, quote, not conservative enough, then they will go and back someone who is more conservative in the primary. 
and former Senator Luger of Indiana and Bennett of Utah ended up being defeated in a primary because they were more moderate by opponents of their own party who were more conservative than they were. On the other side, moveon.org moved against uh, Senator Blanche Lincoln of Arkansas, and while she barely won the primary, she was such damaged goods that she got clobbered in the general election. And that's as a result of all this money shifting from voter registration drives to putting on negative ads and whipping up people's anger, you know, and feeling, you know, that the sky will fall if the other side wins the election. So, you know, we haven't gotten past elections uh, and gone into, uh, you know, allowing those who are elected to govern. Uh, I would say literally since 1996 on that and our country has gotten worse and worse and more divided since every election and of course the mainstream media you know ends up aiding and abetting that you know first of all they like to get paid for all these ads so it increases their bottom line and secondly as i said earlier you know they ended up talking about controversy and conflict and those of us that are trying to do our job and work across the aisle you know never get a shout out by them What's our policy on North Korea? Exactly. I can't hear you. Can you speak up, please? Yeah. What's our policy towards North Korea? I'm confused about that. Well, you know, what I can say is that North Korea has been a bad actor for a long time. And uh, President Clinton uh, sent former President Carter over there. Uh, President Bush Jr. sent a high level delegation over there. The North Koreans have promised to dial back on their nuclear program. Uh, we've sent them money, uh, we've sent them grain on that, and as soon as the heat was up, they broke their promise. And uh, they've moved on so that they are now very close uh, to having a nuclear weapon that is small enough to put on one of their missiles that can hit anywhere in the mainland United States. And the current dictator of North Korea is nutty enough to push the button which is something that the Soviets never did during the Cold War. So, you know, the ultimate goal has got to be the denuclearization of North Korea uh, on that. And the way we have tried it in the past hasn't worked, whether it was under a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. This time it's got to work. Uh, John Nichols, West Highway 19. Um, I think this uh, fallacy that the Republicans are concerned about the budget has kind of been blown out of the water finally. So Jen, Jen Lewinsky came up with a two Santa Claus theory. Republicans have been running up the deficit every time they're in charge, and they don't say much about it, and then the Democrats get in and the sky is falling. We've got to do something about the deficit. This pattern has been going on for 30 years. I've watched it in the state and in the federal. Dreyfus gave away money and left with a deficit. Tommy Thompson gave away money and tax rebates, left the deficit. Reagan complained about Carter's deficits, then he blew that out of the water. And Bush, he blew it out of the water with his trillion dollar war. And now you guys are doing it again. Well, so first of all, it let me say that President Obama almost doubled the national debt. He almost, you know, borrowed more money than his 43 predecessors combined. You know, in terms of the current tax bill, you see our economy becoming stronger and stronger by the day. And one of the things that is in the tax bill is a temporary low repatriation tax because there are a lot of American corporations that simply kept their profits earned overseas overseas because there was a 35 percent repatriation tax if they brought that money back home. That's been lowered to 10 to 11 percent. What has Apple done? And this is the most stark uh, 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 thing. Apple is bringing back over 350 billion dollars that it has squirreled away overseas, which will create 20,000 new jobs in the United States. But it also means that they will pay $38 billion in federal corporate income tax that they never would have paid without the tax bill. 
uh, being passed because they would have kept the money overseas and invested it there. I think that's a win-win for uh, practically everybody. You know, and it shows what having a sensible tax code, you know, will actually do. And we've seen, you know, corporations, you know, give out $1,000 bonuses, put more money in 401ks, raise their starting salaries from 10 to $15 an hour. That is all going to generate more tax revenue because people are making more money uh, and paying more taxes as a result of it. Now, what I can say is with Reagan's tax cut, the individual income tax collections doubled over the 10 years after Reagan's tax cut uh, became effective. The Kennedy tax cut brought in more revenues and the tax rate cuts is not a Republican idea, it's an idea that we picked up from John F. Kennedy because what Kennedy did worked, and it's going to work this time too. I, those tax cuts do not generate more money. This is, this how, do you, how do you answer the $38 billion that uh, Apple's going to pay that they wouldn't have to pay if they kept the money overseas? How do you explain Ronald Reagan's $300 million, billion dollar deficits when he after he cut taxes, well, and all expenditures come from the House of Representatives. Well, it's not the president. You know, the you know the answer to that question is yes and no. And you know, President Clinton and the Republican Congress actually balanced the budget at the end of the nineties. Now, what I can say is is that about two thirds of what the federal government spends are what are called mandatory spending or entitlement programs. It, Sir, that's part of the, uh, excuse me, at 67%. Now, what is happening is that the cost of Social Security and Medicare is going up because the baby boom generation is retiring and they are getting uh, the benefits that they are entitled to because of the taxes they paid during their working years. And, you know, that money you know, has to be raised and spent, and that is an increasing percentage of total federal expenditures, uh, you know, that we are seeing now. You know, and unless there are changes to Medicare and Social Security uh, benefits, you are going to see those increasing expenditures, uh, at least in the near and medium term future. So, you know, what I can say is that people who are complaining about this, whether it's during a Republican administration or a Democratic administration, the only way you get any real numbers is by cutting Social Security and Medicare benefits, which I don't advocate, and I hope you don't either. Well, uh, Jagler, uh, is it, did you guys pass that $350 billion borrowing for uh, prison? Was that passed? Uh, it's passed on the assembly side as an amendment, yes. Uh, it's still waiting for action and saying whether they take it up, we don't know. Because so Walker's claiming we have a surplus and he wants to give $100 away for everyone who has a child. We do have a surplus. Well, then why are you borrowing money? See, I, I don't get the... Did you, uh, did I, you, could get, did I, you pay, my, I could go out with my credit card. Did, did you pay cash for your home? No, but I'm just saying. Look, if you want, if you, your conversation question to him, you should be loving Scott Walker right now, based on your conversation. No. Because we came in with a deficit. Right now, we lowered taxes, and it did bring in more revenue. So much to the fact that we have the surplus that we do have. So and I believe every time that is money that we took in, more than we should have, that it should go back to you. Now, whether how that, how that message or how that path goes that way, I don't know. You borrowed money for the highway department. I mean... It was, it's going to be like a quarter of a highway department is going to be borrowed money now for expenditures for interest. As I said, there's there's a do you do you borrow money for your home? There's there's points where where the bonding for transportation was a, a bit troublesome, but it was still the lowest level of bonding in in the last 25 years in Wisconsin. I just know. The budget is getting bigger, even though it's, um, if you're borrowing money to pay off old debts. Sir, that Wisconsin, been happening. Wisconsin has a budget surplus. That's by the nonpartisan fiscal bureau. Our rainy day fund is at the largest level it has ever been in the state of Wisconsin. 
Like I said, based on your, your questions and your concerns, I, I would expect to see a, a Scott Walker re-election sign on your, on your front lawn. And having said that, we're almost up to 220, so last but not least is Molly Coplin of Terry Lane and Watershaw. Hi, Coplin. Um, I have a whole notebook thing, but I'll kind of narrow it down. We've been talking about school shootings a lot, and I kind of just, while it's tragic, I kind of want to step out and talk about the state of public schools in general. We are seeing st st uh, pardon me, shoestring budgets, lack of any support for teachers, um, and nationwide we have, I think it's like one out of five new teachers dropping within the first three years. We are not seeing the support we need in governments. We are not seeing the counseling support we need in public schools. So my question is, how do we remedy that? And what is Congress doing to make teachers feel supported? Well, elementary and secondary education has largely been the responsibility of state and local governments to set up how they're governed, how they're funded, and the like. Mm -hmm. And the federal government has the principal responsibility for helping fund higher education. Now, there are exceptions rather than the rule. Last year, or excuse me, two years ago, Congress passed and President Obama signed a, part, a bipartisan bill that amended the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And that basically repealed the No Child Left Behind Act, which was one of President Bush Jr.'s uh, principal things. And I was one of 35 Republicans that voted against it. You know, mm -hmm. I was in the White House doghouse until 9-11 came along, and then he and needed then me needed as chairman you. of the Judiciary Committee. <laughs> you know, that being said, no child left behind, and an awful lot of unnecessary standardized tests. Uh, you know, it tried through testing to figure out who the good and bad students and who the good and bad teachers are, and you don't need to have another test to find out either of those two categories uh, on that. And, you know, I think that this gave more flexibility to local government. Now, most of the federal money goes into Title I type programs or handicapped children's education programs. Uh, and Title I programs are heavily tilted toward urbanized areas, so we don't get very much money, you know, out here in the suburbs. And I've been trying to fix that, but haven't gotten very far out. You know, as far as the tax bill is concerned, you know, there are certain benefits for teachers, you know, such as continuation, you know, of the deduction up to $250, you know, to write off expenses that you pay for, you know, when there's this big drive, you know, to essentially get rid of all deductions, period, paragraph, end of story, don't talk anymore about it. You know, that deduction was one that survived. And while it's not big in terms of total revenue lost, I think it is important. Uh, because it does mean that Congress and the tax code are going to have to, excuse me, recognize the fact uh, that teachers do a lot of things on their own mm -hmm. to help the students out, and you know I certainly mm -hmm. recognize that. John, yeah, it, the, this last budget we did, we had the largest state investment in education in history. We also just passed, and, and I, I see your smirk. But I can well, tell you. Well, after cutting it. Yeah. No, no, no. no. Yes. Yes. But I can tell you. Uh, 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 uh. I have, this is my Number third five. term. I have never, ever voted for a budget that cut education. Ever. <laughs> In fact, I have bucked my own governor twice on two budgets we introduced where he did have a flat line and one year with a cut on education. I went in as a freshman, which anybody in Madison will tell you to, not to do to tell your governor you're wrong on this, we need to invest in public education. We did, we got 220 uh, in, in that first year, and you know what happened? I was told I cut education when I ran for re-election, which is, as I said, I have never voted for a budget to cut education. Now when it came to this year, not only did we put in more money for, for uh, education ever, we also targeted so it goes stays in the classroom. And we just passed last week uh, a uh, the problem with the school funding issues is, is the funding formula which is flawed and punishes school districts that in the start had actually um, maintained low spending revenues including Watertown. Watertown is going to get uh, I believe the the figure is 187 thousand more dollars because we're, we're giving money back to school districts that spend it and we're getting punished on the school funding formula. We also increased funding for mental health uh, at, at, a, at a great push from uh, myself and some of my colleagues that realized 
that some of the issues that we're talking about today uh, with the gun issue and things like that are being pushed on, on kids and, and in the schools where they don't have the resources where they're dealing with all of this stuff. So it, the, you can tell that this one bothers me, and it does, because I have fought for public education, but I won't get the, the pushback and the credit, and that's fine, but it is just not true to say that I cut fund funding for public education. We had a bigger investment in Wisconsin in history this last budget cycle. Budget and let me sign off, because uh, we are at 220, by saying it's how we vote that counts. You know, on education issues, I talked about my vote against Bush's No Child Left Behind bill. Mr. Jagler stood up against the governor and voted against the budget that actually cut education. So I think it's important to look at all of our voting records rather than having a broad brush that would say all of one party are good and all of one party are bad. You know, because that is something that actually works against, you know, a, an elected official from casting independent votes. That if the people, when you buck what the majority of your caucus is saying, uh, like your vote and you don't get any credit for it, then why get the heat up in Madison? So with that, I would like to thank you all for coming. It's now 2.20. Uh, the second part of the meeting will be devoted to those.